Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Ben Hayes, the newly appointed director of the Centre for Animal Science. So we'll get started on the talk, and it really focuses on genomes, phenomes, and microbiomes, which is the area that I've been working in. But just to point out, the Centre for Animal Science um, covers a very broad range of disciplines. These are our three themes, pests and diseases, production systems, and animal welfare. And we have world-class scientists in each of these areas. But as I said, I'm going to be focusing on production systems, particularly the genomic area, and just give you some examples of what we're doing in that space with livestock. So one of the technologies we apply or use a lot is genomic selection. I'm not going to go deeply into the theory behind it today because I think you've all heard about it before. But very briefly, um, genomic selection captures the mutations, the effects of mutations on traits we're interested in, like yield, meat quality, uh, fertility, by using genome-wide markers to make predictions of the genetic merit um, animals have for these traits. And the key thing is this could be done at birth of the animals. As soon as the animal's born, you can get a sample and predict the genetic merit for, uh, for breeding of that animal. You can actually even do it from embryos now. So just to give you an idea of the impact of this technology, in my previous job I was working in the Australian dairy industry. And one of the things we wanted to turn around in the dairy industry was the very poor fertility in Holstein Frisian cows, so black and white um, cattle. I think 40 years of harsh selection for milk production, so very hard selection for milk production, had resulted in this dramatic decline in fertility because some of the genes affecting milk production also affect fertility but in the wrong direction. So fertility rates has dropped as low as uh, 40 per cent. So it's very hard to get cows to conceive, which drove farmers nuts. So in 2010, we implemented genomic selection in the Australian dairy industry. And what happened was on this scale is fertility. You can see the fertility declining down, 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 and we started to reverse that trend through this technology. So it's been quite dramatic. Already we've improved fertility rates by 5%. So that's the story in the dairy industry. Made a big impact worth several, well, multiple millions of dollars, actually. The next question is, now that we're back in Queensland and the beef industry is such a large and important industry, can we apply this same technology to beef cattle? So the first thing we did, it wasn't actually the first thing, but one of the early things we did was to look at what the impact, the economic impact for our beef producers could be if we started selecting on fertility and deploying this technology of genomic selection. So we got together with a consultancy firm, Bush Agribusiness, got them to do a really quite sophisticated model using data they'd collected from beef producers' herds over many years to look at what the impact on fertility could be. And it's quite different for different regions of Queensland. Some where you've got very good country, uh, fertility is not such a problem, but particularly up in that northern part, fertility is quite a big problem. And every extra calf you can get on the ground makes you quite a bit of money. And that came through in their analysis. And just to point out, in these top regions of Queensland, you could add $43,000 to a producer's bottom line by selecting for fertility for a number of years. So the value of their business went up because they got extra calves on the ground, which they can then sell. 
So that looked very promising. The economic analysis looked very promising. The next step was to put in place projects that would actually get us there, get us to that point. So that's where this Northern Genomics Project comes in. And the first uh, thing that I started to realise when I started working back in beef cattle was it's much harder to apply the technology in genomic selection in beef cattle than it is in dairy cattle. Dairy cattle, almost wherever you go in the world, with some exceptions, the cattle are the same breed. They're Holstein Frisians, black and white. The world uh, genetic diversity amongst those Holstein Frisians is pretty small. And that makes genomic selection work really well, actually. Beef, you just have to drive through the northern part of Australia and you see how different all the cattle are. You've got uh, Taurus cattle like Angus, um, Herefords, you've got Indicus cattle, Brahmins, and in some cases they're all mixed together. So there's actually an incredible range of diversity. And that's great, but it makes genomic selection quite a bit harder to apply. So what we wanted to end up with in this project was to meet those challenges and to come up with um, genomic breeding values so we could implement the genomic selection for young bulls of any breed or crossbreed going across Indicus and Taurus and the crosses and composites resulting from them as well. And that's, that's quite a challenge, you've got to say. The other challenge is a uh, uh, beef production enterprise in the north is not like a dairy farm. You don't go out in the morning with your quad bike or your dog and get all the cattle in twice a day. Um, in some of these operations, you're getting in the cattle once a year. And it costs you tens of thousands of dollars to do that because you have to do it by helicopter. Basically, no other way. So we needed to come up with a strategy where with the cattle coming in once a year, we could actually get the traits that we needed. I should say to make genomic selection work, you need a huge number of animals with the target trait measured and the genetic markers profiled as well. So we had to put this together, but we couldn't ask people to pay tens of thousands of years for extra, tens of thousands of dollars for extra musters. So we had to work within their system. So this is what we came up with. What we do is when they come in for their muster, when they're about 600 days of age, which is approximately when they're going through puberty, we measure have they gone through puberty or not. People like Jeffrey Fordyce, who you can see here, are experts at doing this. So they do an ovarian scan on the heifers, uh, looking at their corpus luteum or for a corpus luteum to see if they've cycled, if they've gone through puberty or not. And that's the trait that we measure. We also look at heifer rebreed success. One of the toughest things for a, a cow to do in these conditions is to be pregnant with the first calf, successfully rear that first calf and then get pregnant again. So that's the rebreed. It's actually not many cattle can pull out, cows can pull that off. So we look at that rebreed success. A lot of our producers are very interested in temperament. They hate being bailed up by cows and bulls and so on. And that's quite a heritable trait, temperament. The heritability portion of the variation that's genetic is about 40%, so you can certainly breed for it. We also look at fly lesion scores and tick counts as well. So far in this project, um, it's been a, a very big exercise, but we've got 54 collaborating herds across northern Australia. You can see where those herds are located. And our vets who do this scanning, Jeffrey Fordyce and Shannon Landmark, they've just done a tremendous job. They've scanned 21,000, more than 21,000 heifers. So that's an enormous chunk of work. 
We also have pregnancy diagnoses and on the rebreed as well. So the data is really starting to come in. I have started looking at the accuracy of genomic breeding values that are, we can produce from this. So the whole purpose is to crunch this data down, to come up with DNA marker predictions of fertility. So you can test a young bull, will he have fertile daughters or not? And I've looked at the accuracy of these values. And they look encouraging. They're not spectacularly high yet because we haven't got all the data in, but they look very encouraging. Okay, so that's the data collected in that project. Another component we're going to put on top of that to hopefully make the genomic breeding values more accurate is to use whole genome sequence. So if you think about your DNA markers, you think about a, a chromosome, you've got DNA markers spaced out every so many kilobases, for example. You're very unlikely to be right on top of the gene um, or the allele of a gene that is actually causing the real difference in fertility. You're just going to have a marker linked to that. And that's okay, but it causes various problems. The accuracy erodes over time as you get recombination between the markers and the real mutation. It also means it won't work really well across breeds because you can have recombination in the ancestors of those breeds. So we're moving towards using whole genome sequence data. If you think about reading off the entire genome, the real mutation has to be in there somewhere. So that's what we're aiming to find. So our strategy was not just to sequence random animals, but to whole genome sequence the key ancestor bulls of these populations. So if you get the key ancestor bulls that have left behind the progeny that we're now looking at, you should have their chunks of DNA sequenced. They should be passed down from the ancestors to these progeny that we look at. So, so far we've done 150 key ancestors in the Brahmin breed, um, Droughtmaster breed and Santa Gertrudis as well. This has been quite a fun exercise. We've even got um, ampules, so the old glass vials with semen in it <coughs> from 1946 that we've been able to extract DNA from. So we've got some real key ancestors there, which is great. We can actually start to track their genes through the population, what survived and what hasn't. So we use this technique called imputation to recover the sequence in all 30,000 of our cows that we're measuring the fertility traits on. And then hopefully we can find the actual mutations affecting the traits. One of our PhD students, Christy Warburton, has been working with imputed whole genome sequence in her thesis. She's actually had a, some reasonably good results in improving the accuracy of genomic breeding values. It's early days yet, that's for sure, but the accuracies have gone up in some cases. So that's the plan for that project, and it's proceeding quite well. Going to skip now to focusing on specific uh, mutations. And I'll talk about a mutation that has an impact on animal welfare. This is to do with dehorning animals. So it's very common practice now to dehorn animals so they don't damage each other, don't damage the producer, don't cause bruising of the meat and so on. But it is a welfare issue. It's quite a process and the animals do get a, a knockback from this process. But it turns out there are naturally occurring pole mutations. So already in our beef, wider beef population, there's naturally occurring pole mutations. And one of them that's quite well fixed in the Angus breed, for example, which no longer has horned at all, is a 212 base pair duplication on chromosome one. So if you think about chromosome one, 
It's a chunk of DNA that's being duplicated. Okay, just to point out the key thing in breeding, the pole mutation is dominant. That's great. It means if you've got a bull that's heterozygous, 50% um, of the progeny from that bull are going to be um, polled, which is good. But what the breeders are really looking for is these PP or polled poles bulls that carry two copies of the mutation because then every progeny is going to be um, polled. So that's the target, to get more and more bulls that are PP. Now, Brahmin, it's a little bit interesting. shows you what happens uh, in beef breeds. We demonstrated in a paper that was published earlier this year that Brahmin cattle naturally have horns. They don't carry this pole mutation. But our breeders have been mixing things up a little bit. And they actually pulled this chunk of genome through crossbreeding in from Angus or Hereford. So you now get some polled Brahmins as well. A, I should point out a SNP test ex exists for this trait, for polled horns, and it's quite accurate, very accurate. So you can test with a couple of SNPs, is an animal horn polled or is it PP polled polled? However, breeders always want to know things really quickly Ideally, when they've got the animal in front of them, in the crush, they're doing something with it, they want to know the answer. Is this bull horned? Does it carry one copy of the pole mutation or two? So the question started to arise with us, can we test this or think about testing this in real time? And this is where this uh, beautiful little gadget comes in. This is actually a DNA sequencer. It's called a mini iron, and it produces sequence in real time. So you put your sample, extract a DNA in one end of it, and it starts producing sequence as soon as you plug it into the computer. So it really is a, a nice little instrument. I don't want to sound like an advertisement for Nanopore, but it works very well in our lab. So we had a a good, honest, a really good, honest student, um, Harry Lamb, who tested, can you pick up this pole mutation using this technology with the eventual aim of doing this in real time? He certainly didn't do it in real time, but that's the, the possibility, the opportunity. And I wouldn't look too hard at this picture unless you're really familiar with sequence alignments. But what it says is, he could pick up that polled mutation very accurately. The other thing about this uh, nanopore mini iron technology is it gives extremely long reads of DNA. We got up to 240 kilobases in a single read. So that's great for duplications and insertions because you could just span the entire, um, entire mutation, the entire insertion or deletion. So it really is quite a promising technology. So yes, it works and we can pick it up and that's great. Okay, I'm going to, um, since I've told you about nanopore and mini iron, I'm going to move on to another application of the technology, which we're currently running in an MLA funded project. One of the big challenges in the north, northern Australia, is just working out the age of the animals. Is this, if you get two heifers side by side, one slightly bigger than another, is she bigger because she's got better genetics or is she just older? And you could go out there and try and record birth dates, but when you've got thousands and thousands of acres, it's just not practical to do that. And unfortunately, that birth date, getting that birth, well, that date of birth or approximate date of birth right, is a key input into the genetic and genomic evaluations. So it's a key bit of information that lets you disentangle, is this animal genetically better or is she just look bigger because she's older? You really need that for the evaluations. So we started thinking about this and 
inspired by some work that's going on in human forensics, really, we came up with this, well, we co-opted this idea of an epigenetic clock. So the DNA, um, sites in the DNA, in the genome, methylate at a constant rate. Sites in the, in the genome, there's methylation happening all over the place, but there's certain locations that just happen fairly systematically at a constant rate. And that can be used as an epigenetic clock. So in humans, they're using this, say you've got a crime scene, um, you've got a bit of hair from the crime scene or a bit of blood, and you want to get the age of the person that perpetrated the crime. So you can start to get a profile on them. So that's where this technology started to come in and what we got inspired by. It's also being used in dogs to age dogs. Don't quite understand why, but people are using it for that. So Lone, Eugen, is working on this epigenetic clock in cattle. The idea is from a single sample, like a tail hair sample, you might be able to get the age of the animal as well as the genomic breeding values, for example. And again, this nanopore mini iron technology looks very promising for this because it detects um, these methylated sites. So as well as the readout of the actual genome, you get the methylation patterns as well, which is great. So, so far, uh, we've done a small preliminary experiment. I say small, but the amount of data produced is actually massive in this. We just looked to see were the methylation patterns different in heifers born on the same farm from one year to the next. So, it's a preliminary experiment. They might be different because their age is different. They might be different because there was drought one year and not drought the next. But it was just to see if we could distinguish between them. So they were sequenced on the nanopore technology. And indeed, when you do a principal component analysis, so you get all the methylation patterns, you ask, what's the, the most different about these samples? It splits them up by age. So the 2015 heifers end up here, 2016 heifers end up here. I think that that's actually only five because one failed. But it's very preliminary. But it's encouraging that already we can start to see a bit of a pattern there. So Lone showed me this data and I said, let's go for it. So we're about to sequence 100 animals. Um, all of different ages to come up with our epigenetic clock. The ultimate aim is from a tail hair to be able to tell the age of an animal that we can feed into our genetic and genomic evaluations. It all has, also has important implications for meat quality, for example. Okay, so how does all this tie together? We've got this... Uh, vision, I guess you could call it, of what we're calling crush side genotyping. So as I said in the north, animals often come in only once a year. With crush side genotyping, the idea is they'd come in, they'd be in a holding pen, take your samples, run them through the nanopore technology, um, get your specific mutations like horn polled, get your genomic breeding values, get the age of the animal as well. And then by the time they make it through to the end of the crush, you can make a decision about that animal. Is she worth keeping for breeding or does she go for meat production? And you can make it on the spot there and then. I have to say we're a ways from actually doing this. You can start to see we're putting the pieces together but it's certainly a couple of years at least before we deliver on this vision, I think, perhaps more. But when you talk to producers, they love the idea. I think it's good. So it's great. Okay, so that's the genome work. Now we're going to shift to talking about microbiomes. So this is just the cover of The Economist magazine a few years ago saying microbes maketh a man. 
At that point in human microbiology, they were starting to work out just how important the microbiome in our gut, for example, was to our health. So if microbiomes are important to people, they're potentially even more important to cattle, for example. Another way of thinking about a cow is it's a support system for its rumen, which is a giant organ, digestive organ, and it's basically a big vat of microbial soup. And in there are the microbes that can digest uh, low quality forage, for example, turn that into useful product. So the rumen is the way that cattle do this wonderful trick of turning very low quality grass into high quality meat and high quality milk, for example. Okay, the next, next step or the next breakthrough that happened in human genetics was people realised with shotgun sequencing they could just target or they could sequence all the micro, microbes simultaneously. They didn't have to individually culture each microbe. And some microbes just don't culture. So this was a big bro breakthrough, getting a more representative profile of what was in the microbiome. So we could do this in cattle, of course. We can get a rumen sample, squeeze it, get the DNA out of it, and start to profile it. The question we had, still have, is can we use this to predict performance of cattle for traits like feed efficiency and methane emission levels? So when I was down in Victoria, we ran a, a small experiment, again, produced huge amounts of sequence data to see if this was the case. Just to give you a bit of an insight into what we do, the way we process the sequence from the microbiome, Basically, we come up with a microbiome reference sequence with all the possible microbes sequenced, just lay it end to end to end. And then we look at the reads coming out of the sequence data. We just stack up those reads against the sequence. And in that way, we create a profile for each animal. Like for this, this organism might have 10 reads coming off that organism might have a thousand reeds coming off this one. And that gives a relative abundance. It also gives a quantitative measure of what's in the, the <coughs> microbiome. And we could use that in a prediction as well. We can start to take that information and see, does it actually predict our traits? And I can tell you animals, um, after doing this experiment, Animals, even on the same pasture, eat exactly the same diet. There's still a lot of variation going on in their microbiomes. So the experiment we did, we had 28 heifers measured for feed efficiency with their room and microbiome profile. So we had this profile of relative abundance of the microbes. We asked the question, can you predict feed efficiency from this data? So they're actually measured for feed efficiency. Can we then turn around and use the microbiome profiles to predict feed efficiency? Then if you think about it, the feed efficiency is likely to come from room and bug profiles, but also from the animal's own host genome. So we had genomic predictions, uh, genomic breeding values for feed efficiency as well. We looked to see if we add them together do we get an even better prediction of feed efficiency? So big caveat here, this is a small experiment. These results are not statistically significant. Just to show you, give you an idea of what we can do and the trends there. So what we do is, is cross-validation. We drop out a certain proportion of those 28 heifers. We have their room and microbiome profiles. And then using the other animals, we calibrate or come up with a prediction function of what a relative abundance of this bug means, of this bug means, of this bug means, for thousands and thousands of bugs. 
and then we map that, we use that prediction equation to predict the feed efficiency of the heifers we've dropped out for validation. And that's how we come up with this accuracy. So you can see if you use the human, the rumen microbiome profile just on its own, then you get an accuracy of 0.49. If you use the genomic prediction, so the genomic breeding value just on its own, this actually comes from thousands of cattle uh, form the reference population for this, you get 0.33. When you add the two things together, you get 0.57. So it's quite pleasing that you get a bump up. Again, a small study, but just shows you what is possible. And it's quite inspiring to do a bigger experiment, I think. Okay, so that's uh, what we've done in the past or are currently doing. Now I'm going to zoom out just a little bit and talk about uh, a project that could go across the CAS centres, addressing all the issues, well, a number of issues that face our livestock production systems. So just to go into this idea of microbiomes in a bit more detail, I've talked about the rumen microbiome, but of course there's a host of other microbiomes as well. So there's the respiratory microbiome, and it might have an impact on respiratory diseases. And Tim Marney is working on this at the moment. You also have the reproductive tract microbiome, which hasn't been studied in any detail to date, but Arla has a project going in this space at the moment, which is pretty exciting. Pigs and poultry microbiomes are also quite important, of course, for feed efficiency diseases as well, and respiratory microbiomes for respiratory diseases. So we're interested in expanding what we're doing to cover all these microbiomes to really look at can we improve the health, welfare and productivity of our livestock. The idea would be eventually to try and do this in real time. That's one of the ambitions we've got. So if you could do it in real time using nanopore sequencing, for example, you could come up with on farm at point of management uh, information you could use to make decisions. I think at point of management, that was a quote from Pat Blackall. This would allow really rapid decision making which you might need to do if your microbiomes were suddenly uh, deteriorating or going off in a bad way. You might need to make an intervention pretty quickly. And we're likely to be doing, this is a vision for the future. This isn't quite happening just yet. Parts of it are certainly happening at the moment. But it's going to take quite a few years to build up to this. Um, likely we'll be using nanopore sequencing, but with the rate that technologies are developing, let's see. Okay, and in cattle, of course, you could integrate it with crushed side genotyping. So say from a saliva swab, and a lot of the rumen microbes are represented to some extent in saliva. Uh, you could get a profile of the rumen to help you make predictions of feed efficiency and methane emissions. You get your host DNA as well, from which you can predict genomic breeding values, and things like horn poles and age of the animal. So that's, that's like a, a vision for what we have going forward. Okay, that brings me to conclusions for the talk. So genomic selection has really had a major impact on dairy industries, both in this country and around the world. It's really accelerated rates of genetic gain, not just for easy traits to select for, but tough traits like fertility, which is great. Beef, um, there's already been quite a bit of work going on implementing genomic selection. We're adding to that with our very large northern genomics project. And combining that with sequence data looks promising. Um, the nanopore sequencing, it opens up the possibility of crush side genotyping with genomic breeding values, welfare traits, age of animal, 
all from one sample in real time. And I have to say we're at a very early stage at understanding these microbiomes. If you look at the papers in human genetics, they're actually at quite an early stage of understanding as well. It's getting rapidly better, but there's a lot of work to do there. So we need to understand more about the impact on livestock health, welfare and productivity. But we've got this idea of working towards uh, getting this information on farm so that producers can make really rapid decisions that really do contribute to the health and productivity of their livestock. Okay, I'll finish up there, but I'd really like to thank the vets involved in the Northern Genomics Project. They've driven an enormous uh, number of kilometres, done some really hard, tough days as well. All the collaborators in that project and also DAF have been really good at hooking us up with collaborators and just supporting us through that project. Feed efficiency predictions were done down in Victoria with a host of colleagues you see there. And I've really enjoyed having these microbiome discussions with Pat, Tim, Arla, Mary and others as well. Okay, so I'll finish there, but just an advertisement. Um, the Animal Welfare Collaborative, which is another initiative that comes out of CAS. There's a meeting on Thursday, so this Thursday, what time is it today? One o'clock. If you want to hear more about this initiative, there's an open forum here at UQ where you can go and see uh, what they're up to, how they're bringing together all the different groups interested in animal welfare. So that'd be a good thing to attend. Okay, perfect timing. <laughs> perfect timing.